Well, salutation saints. Good morning. How's everybody doing? It's good to be here. I love me some church. We are in Romans chapter 5. So if you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there. If you're lazy and you left your Bible at home, you can follow along with me on the screen. If you don't have a Bible, I'll get you a Bible. As you turn there, I just want to take a minute and uh, just commend you guys for being a great church. Uh, I think a lot of churches in the last nine or ten months have really struggled at maintaining community. And you guys have done an exceptional job at staying connected uh, despite all the different circumstances that we face. But I believe that 2021 is a year that we can move forward and we're going to invest and really be intentional about creating opportunities for you to create community in your life. I believe that you could develop some new friendships and relationships that are deep and meaningful and will improve your life for the better. And so I'm trusting and believing that COVID, the worst days are behind us, that we are going to be moving forward. And as we start opening up Sunday school and Wednesday night adult classes and kids classes and uh, small groups and starting new small groups and shared interest groups and all these different opportunities for community, what I'm doing is I'm asking you to pray about how you and your family would invest into relationships. I think people uh, can be deceived into thinking, oh, I can just show up to church for one hour a week, talk small talk for 10, 15 minutes out in the lobby and be good. But sometimes you can wake up and realize, man, I am relationally bankrupt. And a relationship is only as deep as much as, uh, as, as far as you're willing to put into it. And so I want to challenge you, church, New Hope, Let's make 2021 in, uh, a great year relationally and continue um, to, to invest in, in friendships. So be praying about how you can get involved. Pastor Jeff talked about verses 1 through 11 last week about justification. Did a fantastic job. If you missed that, go back on YouTube. This week, uh, I got tasked with verses 12 through 21. And the title of my message today is the moral monarchies. Turn to your neighbor and say moral monarchies. We're going to be reading from there so you can follow along. I want to just take a second to uh, welcome anybody joining online. And for those over at the Mask On service, we're glad that you're there. And uh, I'm just excited to share God's word with you today. So five, verse 12 through 21. Here we go. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. For before the law was given... Sin was in the world, but sin is not taken into account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was the pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if... By the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man. How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as though the disobedience or excuse me, just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the, diso or the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. Verse 20, the law was added so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that we would be able to understand your word and that you would speak through me exactly uh, what you want to speak and that you would speak to our hearts, that you would um, 
just have an individual message within the corporate message for everyone here, God. Quicken this word by your Holy Spirit and um, apply it in our lives by the power of your Holy Spirit as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this text, as you read it or read it with me, some of you guys are probably going like, what, what was that? Like this is a little bit of a difficult text. I had uh, a little bit of a, a difficult time studying this this week. This was one of the more difficult passages that I've probably ever tackled or been assigned to. Um, But we felt, Pastor Jeff, myself, Pastor Brian, we felt it was very important that we don't just skip ahead to chapter six, but that we address this. And my hopes is that I can help bring a little bit of understanding to you in this tricky nine or 10 verses here. Now, I will be the first to admit, I don't understand everything in this text, and I'm okay with that. The moment you say, I don't understand that, and therefore I can't believe it, is the moment you become a rationalist. And all of a sudden, your understanding becomes the authority, and it is no longer the word of God that regulates your thinking. Now, while I believe that studying and uh, dissecting and trying our best to understand the word of God is a very, very important thing to do, and we should do that, I have also come to terms with that there is much in Scripture that I just cannot comprehend and I don't fully understand. Who can really understand the virgin birth? Who can comprehend that? Who can understand the Trinity where where you have God as three persons yet one, where you've got God the Father and Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit, and they are all three, they're individuals, but yet they are one. Who can understand that? Who can understand the two natures of the person of Jesus Christ where he is 100% God and he is 100% man? There is a lot in scripture that I don't understand, but caution to the man who says in his heart, I cannot accept and believe what I do not understand. So I hope that I can bring some understanding, but I don't claim to have all the answers this morning. So let's dive in, we're gonna go through this, and uh, the first thing that I want to take note of is, is, is that Paul is using this parallel comparison between Adam, who is the first man created by God in the Garden of Edom, between Adam and of Jesus. And if you've been in church a long time, you've probably heard the term second Adam. Okay, who is second Adam? It's Jesus. Why is Jesus referred to as second Adam? Because in the same way that Adam did not have a biological father and was birthed through a supernatural spiritual work, so did Jesus. He did not have a biological father. We'll get to why that's significant a little bit later, but let's dive into verse 12. I hope you've got your notes. Put on your thinking caps as they told me in third grade. I haven't taken it off since. Verse 12 Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. So verse 12 is a big verse, and it's one of the main verses where the doctrine of original sin comes from. How many ever heard of the doctrine of original sin? Original sin is, it simply says this, we are all guilty and held guilty in God's sight for the sin of Adam. So original sin, we are guilty through Adam's sin. Let's break this verse down and see if we can't understand this doctrine a little bit better. So verse 12, just as sin entered the world through one man. Who was that one man? Adam. So just as sin entered the world through Adam, sin entered the world through Adam, and death through sin. It says, and death through sin. So we see here that because Adam sinned, now there is death. There's this sequential order, okay? The penalty, or I should say the natural consequence of sin is death. We have Adam sinning, which brought about death, and going on in this verse, and in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. So we see that all men received death, why? Because all sin. So you might be thinking, you're telling me that before I ever made the conscious decision to defy one of God's commands, that I'm already guilty of sin? Yes, I believe this. Why do I believe this? Well, let me ask you what the consequence of sin is. What what is the consequence of sin? 
death, both physical death and spiritual death. We see in this next chapter, in Romans chapter 6, for the wages of sin is death. The author of Hebrews writes, there can be no forgiveness of sin. There can be no forgiveness of transgressions unless there is shedding of blood, which is essentially saying you can't be forgiven of sin or your transgressions unless something dies. Death is the natural consequence of sin. So let me ask you this. How could a newborn baby suddenly die unless sin was in the picture? Because surely this baby hasn't broken a command, but if there weren't sin or there wasn't, if there was no sin, there would be no death, correct? So in this verse, because all sin simply means that we all sinned. Prior to personally making the decisions in life, we are all somehow guilty through the sin of Adam. Now somebody stop and ask me, how can this be, Austin? How can I be held accountable for something that I didn't do? Go ahead and ask me, how can this be? I have no idea. I don't get it. I don't fully understand it. It's, it's, it's one of those things that I just don't understand. And, and, and there's other things in this passage that I don't understand, but as I was thinking this week, how can I explain original sin and, and make sense of it? This helped me a lot, and I believe that this was a thought from the Lord this week. And, and, and I thought about a purebred dog. Would you say we've got a 100% purebred St. Bernard? How many believe in big dogs? Dogs should not be the size of a rat. You should have a big dog, Okay. Got some amens there, okay? Big dog, St. Bernard, 100% purebred. Now imagine this, this dog mating with another dog. Let's say a chihuahua, okay? As soon as that purebred St. Bernard intermingles, the genetics change of its offspring forever and ever and ever. It doesn't matter how many times those dogs, those reproduced dogs, reproduce over and over and over, and they try to get back to the St. Bernard. There's always going to be a small, small percent of chihuahua in that dog. And the same is of Adam, sin. It's as if his nature and his genetics were changed. And even though we are hundreds of generations removed from Adam, we still inherit an impurity. It's original sin. As we read on, we'll see that verse 13 confirms our deductions of verse 12. So verse 13, for before the law was given, Sin was in the world, but sin is not taken into account where there is no law. So sin was in the world before the law was given. The law that Paul is addressing right now is the law that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. That's why in verse 14 it says, nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam, the first man, and the time of Moses even over those who did not sin by breaking a command. That time between Adam and the giving of the law and Moses proved that there was sin in the world despite not having the law. Take a look at the story of the flood, right? Sin was running rampant. Noah is going around saying, repent, turn from your ways. How does he know that? Well, I believe that Corinthians talk, or uh, Paul talks a little bit uh, about the universal law on people's hearts. You know, how did, how did Noah know to tell people to repent and turn from their sins if the law hadn't been given yet? I believe there's a universal law that's on people's hearts. That's how Gentiles would have known what to do, right? Sin was running rampant and the effects were evident. So what did receiving the law for, uh, do for people? It made people aware that they were sinning. If you've never been made aware of an expectation how can you ever know that you're failing to meet that expectation? There's some marriage advice right there. Don't get mad at your spouse at unmet expectations if you haven't clearly made the expectation. Right? Hello. <laughs> Verse, uh, the second half of 13 is, is a little bit tricky, okay? Let's take a look at that together. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. 
What does that mean? Does it mean that it's impossible to sin and it was impossible to sin before the law was, was given? No, because if you remember back to Romans chapter 2, verse 12, and you can follow along on the screens, it says, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. You can sin not knowing the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. This is one of those mysteries in, in Scripture that I just, I don't fully understand. But God, in his fairness, and God, in his sovereignty, can judge someone fairly when they fail to meet expectations that they weren't even aware of. The problem is that our assessment of fairness isn't always fair. I remember this one time, well, the only time, that Elizabeth and I were in Germany. How many have ever been to Germany, right? And we were based in Munich, and we decided, hey, we want to go see a cool castle. So we're going to go to Neuschwanstein Castle. Anybody ever been to Neuschwanstein, seen it? Beautiful. This is a picture that I took that's on my iPhone 5C at the time. A beautiful castle. Here's another picture from Mary's Bridge. Look at that view. That's absolutely gorgeous. The castle's not bad either, but that view is... <laughs> Thanks. That's my dad joke for the day. So we're on this train, and we get there, and I don't remember if it was there or the way back. I think it may have been the way back. The conductor of this train comes by and says, let me see your tickets, the ticket master. So I, I give him my tickets, and he says, you own a fine. I said, what do you mean? I just gave you my tickets. I purchased these tickets. And he goes, you did not timestamp these tickets. These tickets are not valid. You're trying to cheat. I said, what in the world? I, I can't read German. We almost missed our train getting here because you, have anybody traveled public transportation in a foreign country where the language is not English? It is the most stressful thing in the entire world. I'm looking at nursh, nursh, sneaky, snarsh, you know, language up there, and I cannot understand it. I didn't see anywhere in English, much less did the person who took my money to buy the thing say, you need to go timestamp that. I had no idea, so I begged with this guy. I said, honestly, I'm not trying to cheat anything. I didn't know, and sure enough, he gave me a fine. Here's a picture of my fine I took of it because 27 euros, and the extra, I don't know how much dollars that is, but it's more than what I wanted to pay, right? Now, I was ticketed, but was he wrong for fining me? Was he being fair? I obviously broke the law, but it wasn't intentional. So should I have been let off the hook? You bet I should have been let off the hook. You better believe it. No, I'm just teasing. He had every right to find me. And that's exactly what he did. So how does God deal with those who sin while they don't even know that they are sinning? I'm not entirely sure, but I am confident that he does deal with the sin because if he just ignored it, there would not have been death between the time of Adam and the time of the giving of the law to Moses. Where it says in this verse, not taken into account, cannot mean that sin is simply swept under the rug because there was and is death. It means something else, and I'm just thankful that we serve a God who is fair. And what is fair is up for God to decide. I don't claim to have all the answers, but this is as much sense as I can make of it this week, and I hope it's starting to click. Also, I want to tell you this. This is one of those sermons that might be a lot to, to chew on. You might have to go back and listen to it again, or if you want access to my notes, I will happily send you this sermon. That way, if what I've written down doesn't come out the way I wrote it down, you can put your eyes on it, and you can get the correct version of the sermon right here, and I'd be happy to share that with anybody who would like to get their hands or eyes on this. Let's move on to verse 14. How many uh, thinking caps are expired already? <laughs> Nevertheless, Death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam, who was the pattern of the one to come. So I touched on the death from the time of Adam to Moses, but now we see Adam as being a pattern of the one to come. So I believe that this has been interpreted two different ways. One, 
I don't believe that either one is wrong, but I believe that one is maybe more right. I, I was talking with uh, someone, and they're like, well, the pattern of one to come is, well, Adam is an example for all humanity, and so sin is learned, and, and, and you are setting the example for those who come behind you. And I would say that that is 100% true in that statement. Parents, your kids will end up being and parenting like you parent. Older brother, older sister, your, your siblings are looking up to you. Grandparents, you are setting a pattern of those to come. We need to be intentional of this, but what I believe this, this verse is actually saying, he's, Adam is the, ex, uh, the example of one to come, is, is pointing to Jesus Christ. Okay? He's the pattern in the sense that both Adam and Jesus were born blameless and pure and without sin. Why? Because they were both conceived by the Spirit of God. They did not have a tainted or an impure seed conceiving them. This is very important. This is extremely important. Those who deny the virgin birth are denying Jesus the ability and the power to create a new monarchy. They are denying Jesus the ability to create a new lineage, one of holiness, righteousness, and purity. The virgin birth nullifies the curse of original sin. Now, why is that important? Because in our universities and in your own logic, you say, I can't understand the virgin birth and therefore I just won't accept it. Well, what's the problem in that? As soon as you take away the virgin birth is the moment that you make Jesus a sinner inherently and now his sacrifice on the cross is not good enough for your sin. If there was no virgin birth of Jesus, we don't have eternal life through Jesus. The virgin birth is very important. The second Adam in the sense that Jesus was born of the Spirit is very important to understand. So let's read about this new lineage, this new monarchy, this new family, this new seed that Christ has made available for us to step under and live under in verses 15 through 19. Follow along. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Again, the gift of God is not like the result of the one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was the condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man the many will be made righteous. So verses 15 through 19, you might read that and be like, okay, we got, we got you in verses 15 and 16, Paul. Stop repeating yourself. But how many know that in Scripture, when God repeats himself, it's something that's important? Right? God is wanting you to get something this morning. What is that thing this morning? That, that the lineage of Adam, there's sinfulness, there's depravity, there, there is death. But through Jesus Christ, there is a new lineage, there's a new monarchy of holiness and righteousness and purity and life. And, and, and through Jesus, we now have access to this gift of peace with God and eternal life. Take a look at the end of verse 19 where it says, the many will be made righteous. Note how he doesn't say many are righteous or that 
all are righteous. He says that they will be made righteous. Now, how can this be? How will they be made righteous when we still fall under the lineage or the seed of Adam? How can this be when we are born into sin? How can this be when both our personal sin that we've committed and the sin that we were inherited through Adam, how it makes us destined for death? How can this be? Well, we have an opportunity to change our lineage and live a life under the seed of Christ. When Jesus was talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he simply said to them, he said, one must be born again. You must be born again. Nicodemus is like, this doesn't make sense. I don't understand. I can't just like jump back in my mama's womb, right? You're born once. And Jesus said, flesh gives birth to flesh, and spirit gives birth to spirit. You must be born again of the spirit. That's why we call ourselves born again Christians. In the same supernatural way and power that Jesus was born by the spirit of God, something supernatural that I don't fully understand happens in your spirit and you become rebirthed. You become born again of the spirit where now your spirit isn't sinfulness. It's not wickedness. It's not selfishness. It's not depravity and all of these different things. Now I get born of the spirit of Jesus Christ and I've got holiness, righteousness, purity, and life. It's a supernatural work. And scripture and the word is very clear that if you've been born again by the spirit, that when you die and you stand before God, God will judge you and see that you are in the monarchy of Jesus Christ. That you are in the lineage of Jesus Christ. That you are no longer in Adam's line. You are no longer de- wicked and, and sinful. But you have a new father a pure father, a pure lineage. We become the sons and daughters of God. He adopts us. The old is gone and the new has come. So you have a a choice of which moral monarchy to live by. Adam's or Jesus's? Have you made that decision? Have you reverted that decision. Musicians, would you come? Today's teaching helps us better understand our need for a spiritual birth, but I want to end by getting practical because knowing all of this stuff is not going to advance the kingdom of God, but it helps. And knowing all of this isn't going to bring about life change, but it will help. And there's only two appropriate responses when we have a sermon like today. The first response is for anyone here that their eyes have been opened and they say, man, I'm living under the the monarchy of Adam. I'm sinful. God has revealed the darkness in my heart. He's, He's revealed this need for something to change. He's revealed a a, a needing of a spiritual rebirth in my heart and God has graced you with eyes to be able to see your need and you're ready to switch monarchies. This decision shouldn't be made impulsively but it should be made soberly and sincerely because when you switch monarchies, you switch families. You now become subject to a new set of rules. You are stepping into a new way of living, a new way of thinking, a new way of being. So before I give an opportunity for those who have come to that realization and are ready to ask God for forgiveness, that are ready to to take off the seat of Adam and to step into the family of Christ and of Jesus, of eternal life, of peace with God so that you can have peace in your heart. Before I give that opportunity, I want to speak to those who are already living in Christ. I want to talk to the church, to the Christians. Allow the Spirit of God right now just to begin to speak in your mind and your heart. 
Because I believe that this sermon is for the corporate, but God is downloading individual sermons in your hearts right now. For some of you this morning, maybe God is prompting you to give up alcohol this year and instead be filled up with the Spirit of God. The benefits of alcohol, oh, I feel loose. I feel like I can be myself. I feel like I can let down. I feel like I can relax. It's a cheap substitute for being full of the Spirit of God. Maybe God is is speaking that. Maybe he's not speaking that to you right now. Maybe, maybe God is nudging on your heart and saying, there's an area of rebirth, of spiritual rebirth that needs to take place in your finances because right now money has the reins of your heart. And this year you're going to step into the discipline of tithing and saying, God, I trust you with my first fruits. I give you honor. So I'm gonna give you the first fruits and then I'll worry about the bills and the wants. Maybe God is is talking about spiritual rebirth in your family where, where there's something in your heart where you've got unforgiveness towards someone in your family or there's discord in your family. Church, we need to be the church. We need, we need to be responsive because we are now living in Christ. And, and just as when we're saved, yeah, justification happens. And now Jesus will view us and God will view us as if we're in Christ. But now this thing called life that we're walking in and that we're living in sets in place sanctification. Where Jesus is saving us from the power of our sins. And we're to look more like our Father. Maybe there's a toxic relationship or friendship that you know you need to get out of so that you can get spiritually healthy. Could it be that God wants you to get off of social media and get into the word of God? What is it that God is wanting to do in your life? What areas need rebirth, born again? The world doesn't need a complacent church. Hear me, the world doesn't need just another nice guy at your work. They need someone who has been renewed and full of God. Church, I beg you, get serious about your walk with God. Some of you wasted 2020. Some of you have wasted the last nine or 10 months where life was forcibly slowed down and God is saying, do you think there's gonna be enough time for me? And he shook your world. And in March, it was online church. And oh, I'm so thankful for the internet and different things. And by June, you're filling up your Sundays and everything else with something else. Even though life is slowed down and God is saying, return to me. Return to me. Be born again. That's the old way of living. That's the old way of thinking. I have something so much more for you. Some of you need to exchange your fear of what's going on right now for the peace of God. Listen, when you are in Christ, he is the prince of, the prince of peace. peace. There's no room for fear. He's on the throne. He was yesterday, he is today, and he will be forevermore. Church, When are we going to be the church? We ask rhetorical questions, and I am guilty of this as well. When I ask a question that cuts, you better believe it that it cut me first in my preparations, right? When you ask a question like, when was the last time you you brought someone to church? When was the last time you introduced someone to Jesus? Well, when was it? When was the last time you gave sacrificially of your time, of your resources? We got an opportunity to bless Doug and Kareen today. Take you probably 45 minutes, an hour. I hope it doesn't end up taking five. (laughs) What is God speaking to you? What areas of your life do you need to surrender? What areas of your heart need born again? Would you stand with me and close your eyes? Bow your heads.
If you're here or you're watching online, you're in the mask on service, you'd say, Pastor Austin, I, I know that I know that I need to be born again. I know that I need the forgiveness of sins. I know that there's nothing that I can do, nowhere that I can go that will earn my way to heaven, but I need to be forgiven and made new. I need to step into the monarchy of Jesus this morning. You've seen your sinfulness and your need for Christ in this morning for the first time. This is not a rededication. We'll get there. This is for the first time. You say, I am, I'm stepping out of the seat of Adam. I'm stepping into the seat of Christ. I, I am, I'm choosing to live and I'm trusting my life with his forgiveness. If that's you. Would you just raise your hands? With every eye closed, head bowed. Is there anyone here? Yes, I see you in the back. God sees you. God loves you. God is with you. I pray right now that you would sense his presence, his spirit, the forgiveness that flows freely because he loves you, because he wants you, and he's got a purpose and a plan for you. Would you just repeat this prayer after me if if you're watching online or you're here and you respond to Jesus, enter my heart. Save me from my, sick, my, my, my sinful ways. I pray, God, that you would change my heart, change my thinking, change my very being. Give me the genetics of Christ, of holiness, of, of purity, of righteousness. And fill me with your spirit that I might live in a way that truly reflects you, God. I trust you with your plan for my life. I'm done living my way and by my rules and by what I think is right. And I choose to live in the way that you want me to live. Forgive me and save me. Enter my heart in Jesus' name. And just continued right now. How many would say, man, the spirit of God is speaking something to me. There's something in my heart that needs rebirth. There's something that needs change. There's something that needs to die so that I can live as Christ. If that's you in this room right here, would you just raise your hand? I wanna be able to pray for you, yes. Yes, God, as you just speak, I pray that you'd continue to speak and, and that we would be sensitive to your Holy Spirit, Lord. And so continue to refine this congregation, your people and your bride, that we would become beautiful, that we would look more like you, that we would rise to the occasion of being your church at such a time as this, Lord. Help us, God, to reflect you better in 2021. Our hope is in you, Jesus. It's not in our works, it's not in ourselves, but our hope is in you. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name. Victory in who? Jesus. Oh Christ be praised, I have victory. Right? No! Christ be praised because it's not about you and what you do, but it's about what Christ has done. And we can praise him because our hope is secure. Praise God, praise God, praise God. And may your life reflect that knowledge. May your life reflect the reality that Jesus has saved you. May it excite you, ignite you, and move you into action. God is so good.